everybody welcome back to another video here on financial friends and the latest edition of this week in finance a video or podcast where i talk about everything that has went on this week in finance that i have found notable so without further ado hit subscribe join the growing and hopefully growing to 1000 subscribers friend group i greatly greatly appreciate the support before we get into things, because we had a green week or a relatively uh, green week, I know the S&P and Dow Jones behind me are down a little bit, but the NASDAQ was up again. I think that was the fifth straight day. Hit that like button down below and let's go ahead and get into the stories that I found interesting. First things first here, Disney has a new cruise ship. It is called Wish and it will be making its first voyage very, very soon. I do believe it is going to be on the 14th. Let me go ahead and pull up some of my notes here. Um, yes, it'll be taking off on July 14th, headed to Castaway K, Disney's private island in the Bahamas. Now, this massive 1,119 foot new cruise ship is the first in 10 years and I do believe it comes at a pretty rough time. People are looking to cut back. People initially are very, very excited about finally being able to take vacations, which does push up prices because the demand is high, but there are some signs that consumers are kind of weakening as recession fears and inflation kind of hit. It's also difficult for Disney because, of course, they started planning and building the ship nearly five years ago at this point, but operating the ship has gotten insanely more expensive over that five-year time horizon. I mean, costs are up, gas is up, wages are up. They're going to have to pay, I think the amount of crew on board is nearly 5,000 people, if I do believe that is the correct number. It could have been 4,000. I'm searching the article here for that number. Sorry, 1,500. I was way off. 1,500 crew members on board, but they all have to make money, right? 75% of these people are experienced, and there's going to be room for 4,000 different passengers. Now, obviously, a massive, massive ship. This is kind of on the verge of when people are deciding if they want to like I said, venture out again. You have 80% of cruisers or people who are taking cruises who say, yes, they will do it again. That number is pretty in line with the past or pre-pandemic levels in terms of cruises. Now, the chairman of Disney Parks Experiences and Products says he has absolutely no worries about the cruise industry rebounding. You have other big players like Carnival kind of struggling the article mentioned they have three times as more debt as they had before the pandemic. So for companies that exclusively do cruises, this is not a great time. For Disney, who just in this segment alone has already grown revenue, they're going to do okay. They can soak these costs. Now, they do have something that is coming up in 2024. I'm going to touch on in a second. That could be a pretty, pretty penny that they have to get rid of. But for this time being, they don't have too much worries about the cruise industry kind of falling apart. They do expect there to be bumps in the road. I think everybody expects there to be bumps in the road as we slowly kind of crawl back, but also get knocked down as this recession, potential recession, I should say, um, is kind of on the horizon. So speaking about that big price tag, like I mentioned, there is a potential for Disney to have to, and I mean actually have to, Comcast can basically force their hand here to get rid of at least $27.5 billion to acquire the 33% stake that Comcast currently holds in Hulu. So at the time, Bob Iger was acquiring Fox. They paid a massive pretty penny for Fox. So Comcast did them a solid, right? In the entertainment industry, of course, everyone's going to do everyone a little solid. The continued success of the industry is what really matters for everybody, um, which the entertainment industry is never going to go anywhere anytime. We all love to be entertained in bad times, good times, any times, right? But anyways, I digress. So um, at the time, Bob Iger was had a solid kind of given to him and Comcast held on to their stake in Hulu. Now, come 2024, Disney could potentially get forced to acquire that 33% stake that Comcast did them a solid with and held on to. Now, the minimum 
expense of that is going to be $27.5 billion. I'm going to highlight that here in the article so you can see it. Now, this price tag could, of course, and I'm reading directly from the article now, quoting here, the price tag could be higher depending on a fair market value of Hulu in 2024, and that would, of course, be determined by a third party. So again, as we approach 2024, Comcast could force Disney's hand into expelling at least $27.5 billion. Now, if Comcast decided that Hulu was a better fit for them, they currently have the Peacock platform. They could acquire Hulu, um, really do Disney a potential solid back, acquire the whole entire platform. Now, this obviously means they're not going to get $27.5 billion from Disney, and instead they are going to have to pay up and acquire the remaining part of Hulu. Now, Hulu is kind of the man in the middle, so to speak, because it doesn't quite align with Disney. Now, Disney owns the majority of it. They operate Hulu, and it is a part of their Disney bundle. This is where Hulu is a plus. You have Disney, which is sort of kids and family. You have Hulu, which kind of is the adult version of everything that Disney owns, but none of the Disney or Pixar branded, Marvel branded things are on Hulu. It's more traditional TV, traditional uh, TV series and movies, and then also some things that are on linear television or network television, like Dancing with the Stars, um, things that are aired on ABC. Comcast also has some of their things on it, which of course, once those fall off, they will reserve those only to be shown on Peacock. So this is a very interesting situation. Hulu has 41 million subscribers, but is only available in the United States. This kind of forces Disney's hand because that big Disney Plus bundle can then only be available in the United States. So they can't push this overseas for this massive value. The value of that Disney Plus bundle is extreme and it gets a ton of people, including myself, to sign up. I mean, for $14.99, I think it is, you get access to uh, ESPN, Hulu, and Disney Plus. That is very, very good. Now, this is a great deal and a great draw. Again, only available in the U.S. So do they get rid of Hulu and have the Disney Plus ESPN bundle? Do they buy Hulu out and then get rid of it and merge it into Disney Plus? There are a ton of different options here, but either way, $27.5 billion is going to have to be spent if they want to do that. That's the minimum. Disney doesn't know what's going on. Disney has not said they know what's going on. Disney employees, media executives, analysts, investors, none of them know exactly what will go on with Disney. Now, what I know with Disney personally is I think they should hold on to Hulu in some capacity. Why? I am a big fan of being extremely diversified, of holding on to a ton of assets to be able to play with. Now, obviously, these companies have to spend a lot of money to run these assets, so they have to be profitable and make sense economically. However, I would enjoy Hulu being acquired in some form of capacity. The entertainment industry, the streaming industry is something over the long run that is only going to get bigger as more people adopt it. The consolidation of that industry is going to be critical and the winners of that are going to profit a ton if they can continue to generate great content. Now, Disney, of course, generates great content. They're going to have a ton of different ways to stream and air that content. I feel as if Hulu could be a good piece of it. I don't quite know where or how. I do know that Hulu kind of being a more adult version of Disney would be fantastic, airing those ABC and other exclusive things on there. But that is, of course, yet to be seen. And we will continue to follow up on this probably in two years, unless, of course, something is announced prior to that. Moving on from that, we do have Tesla delivering 254,695 vehicles in Q2 of 2022. This is up roughly, let me grab the percentage here in the article, 26.5% year over year, but down from the prior quarter, 17.9%. They pretty much hit the actual number of deliveries. They missed very slightly 256,000 or 256,520 vehicles were expected. Um, That looks like about a 2,000 or give or take 2,000 car difference that they fell short of. 
This came, of course, with massive, massive constraints on the supply chain, on the product side, um, with Russia and Ukraine, with, of course, potentially demand being hampered, with not being able to produce as much in China. There is so many different aspects of this that caused them to be 2,000 vehicles short. Now, I'm not a direct investor in Tesla, so these sort of results don't quite matter to me, but obviously a massive component of the S&P, of VOO, of VTI, ETFs I do invest in. So I would love to see Tesla do fantastic because it would help my portfolio personally. Um, the company has said, look, moving into the future, we expect to continue to be able to grow production capacity. They almost delivered all of the vehicles that they did produce. About 4,000 or so were not delivered. Elon Musk has came out and said, look, we are looking to build and to grow production capacity. However, these new factories in Austin, Texas, and then also in Berlin, um, adding to their already pretty good repertoire of production plants are costing us a lot of money and are not making that money back yet. These are big investments that a lot of big Tesla investors expect to pay off over the long run because of course, you can't sell cars unless you can make them and the demand for Teslas is extremely high. So ramping production is really their big goal. There's a lot of competitors. BYD was thrown around a lot in headlines. That's a Warren Buffett Chinese backed electric car company. They were rumored to be like on pace to do more than Tesla. The numbers don't quite shake up. Ford is struggling to produce vehicles they can make a profit on. And other companies are expected to pass Tesla in the long run simply because the demand and market share of those companies are a lot larger. I think Tesla can hold on. I think they can hold their own. It's just going to be a matter of making smart, rational investments and Elon Musk not pumping, pumping and dumping like 7,000 other different things and actually focusing on what he is trying to do. Speaking of pumping and dumping certain things, Elon Musk notified Twitter today as I'm recording this. Um, I normally do stories that aired from Thursday to Thursday. I normally record this on a Thursday. I'm of course recording this on a Friday, so this is getting looped into the bundle here. Um, but Elon Musk notified Twitter he is terminating the deal or looking to terminate said deal. Um, the attorney did quote, Twitter has not com complied with its contractual obligations. So that is pretty much it. He said he really wanted to see that about 5% of the monetizable daily active users were spam, no more, no less. Twitter has, quote, failed or refused to provide this information. Sometimes Twitter has ignored Mr. Musk's requests. Sometimes it has been rejected, uh, rejected them for reasons that appear to be unjustified. And sometimes it has been claimed to comply while giving Mr. Musk incomplete or unusable information. Of course, this news just came out. Twitter did not immediately respond for some form of comment. I will leave any updates that happened over the weekend before this goes up on Sunday in the comment section down below. So check that out if you're looking for any potential updates on this story. Moving forward, we do have oil tanking about 10% or so. It kind of drops below that $100 mark, which is good for people at the pump. The, the cost of gas is slowly declining, although many people think um, it is not going to continue in that direction. There's a lot of fear around, and I'm going to read some more quotes here, tightness in global oil balances increasingly being countered by the strong likelihood of recession that has began to curtail oil demand. So there's, of course, not enough oil to go around right now. But what is being priced into the oil market is the fact that people might not need as much oil because a recession is happening. And as a result, consumers of gas, of oil, will cut back. The oil market appears to be homing in on some recent weakening in apparent demand for gasoline and diesel. This is exactly what I just said. This was what one of the Rittenbush and associate firms reported to their clients. So there are some wild predictions with oil moving forward. This happened, this, this sort of 10% decline happened after six months of continued gains. So we're not really at like any form of equilibrium, right? We ran for six months um, negatively, of course, for consumers, positively, of course, for oil companies and for people looking to profit off of energy or oil companies. Um, Citibank or Citigroup assumes that if we have a recession, $65 a barrel 
could be the end price towards the end of this year. Goldman Sachs, on the other hand, produces $140 or more per barrel. The reason I mention this is because we saw six months of a run, a 10% decline. We're not seeing any form of consistency in this pricing. Now, the consistency prior to this 10% decline was, of course, the continued growth of oil over and over and over. And by over and over, I mean month over month. However, we're not seeing that anymore. We're seeing a 10% decline. So I'm not going to try and tell you I'm just some random kid on the internet. I am not going to try and tell you where oil is going to go. I'm not going to tell you it's going to get cheaper for you at the pump. And I'm not going to tell you it's going to get more expensive. I quite literally have no clue. And neither do some of the largest banks in the world. 65 and 140 are opposite ends of the spectrum. It's going to fall probably somewhere in there, um, or one of them is going to look really, really right if it falls below or above their projections. Either way, things with oil are getting wild, and there is no sign of any form of consistency coming soon. Obviously, we still have Russia. Um, it kind of hampering a lot of the supply. We have the Saudis basically coming out and saying, we do not have any form of excess oil. The market, the demand for oil is still really, really tight. The pricing of the markets is coming down because of the recession expectations, but there is no easier way for us to get oil. So if demand continues to go up or stays you know, current, which over periods of recession, um, they quote here, TD Security says, yeah, recessions don't really have a great track record of killing this demand. And especially with the product at such low levels, we're assuming it's going to continue to go up. So whether it ends up at 140 or 65, I have no clue, but I'll be here week over week reporting back to you to let you know what exactly it is doing. Now, what we do know is happening in the crypto markets is everything is going down. Um, we have here, and I'm going to read off of my notes really quickly, BlockFi taking out emergency loans and potentially going to be acquired by FTX at some point. We have Voyager filed. This is the headline here on the screen filing for bankruptcy. Three Arrows Capital filed for bankruptcy, and Celsius has since frozen withdrawals. None of this is good, and I'm not going to make any direct comments on the bankruptcy and anything like that because I'm going to be quite frank with you. I don't know the difference between Chapter 11 bankruptcy and Chapter 13 or 15. or so. I know there's so many different chapters of bankruptcy, right? All I know is that these companies are not currently in fantastic spots. And I made a tweet. Um, go ahead, follow me on Twitter at FinFriendsYT. I'm always on Twitter commenting, tweeting back at people, starting conversations, asking questions. So go ahead and follow me there. But I tweeted, does anyone else remember when basically every single major crypto exchange or broker came out and they were doing interviews when Bitcoin was running, making $100,000 price predictions, $500,000 price predictions, and they stated very clearly, mind you, very clearly, they were properly leveraged and could handle any amount of volatility. They straight up, and I was, I was a believer, right? I was a believer that, that this was the case. Um, they lied. Flat out, they lied right to your faces because BlockFi was one that I had my money in. And so I was keeping an eye on the founder or CEO of the company at the time, making sure that what he was stating was correct, right? I was I was checking up on what his level of confidence was that they could handle any form of volatility. They, they couldn't. And I'm going to quote a little bit. I'm going to have a video coming out in the future. Paul from Everything Money and Jeremy Financial Education have been beefing recently. Um, and one of the videos was really centered around uh, Jeremy's investment in Voyager Digital. And now he basically stated that there's no way that we're going to see prices come back to 20000 and And Paul really called them out. That's going to be a whole nother discussion. I'm basically not listening to people, including myself. I got a random kid on the internet. Anyways, his sort of point there was he assumed and, and all these companies assume that if prices do come down to 20,000, which is what pretty much we're at right now with Bitcoin, um, that they would be fine, that they could handle this. That actually, matter of fact, if it did drop, it would probably be good because we're seeing a ton of investment from institutions. And so institutions might assume that now this is a good time to buy because we're up at all-time highs, and why would institutions invest at all-time highs? Well, that's exactly what happened across the board, and we're seeing all of those dominoes fall now. So stay safe. Stay careful out there. Um, and just remember, they all lied to your face, including me. 
Moving forward, we have a, another massive company making another massive move. Amazon took a stake in Grubhub and added the food delivery perks, which is this Grubhub Plus offering, which is free delivery, um, to their platform. Now, not commenting too, too much on the business uh, perspective side of this for Amazon. The details are here in the article. All the articles are always linked down below. So you can go ahead and check those out. Essentially, the partnership gives Amazon the option to take a 2% stake in Grubhub, which is owned by JustEatTakeaway.com, which is a European company. Um, and then potentially increasing that stake to 15%, depending on how things go, um, such as how many new customers are added probably through this. Now on this news, Uber, which has Uber Eats and DoorDash, both fell. Uber, not so much because they're more a you know a car company, right? They're able to uh, transport people. What's the word I'm looking for? Taxi service. They're more like a taxi service, um, but they also have Uber Eats, which is the food delivery. They fell 3%. DoorDash fell 9%. They're a pure play food delivery company. Now, this is good for Grubhub, obviously. They're going to add a bunch of customers because there's a millions of people subscribed to Amazon Prime who are probably going to at least do this once or twice, kind of start playing with it. The vice president of Amazon Prime mentioned that the value of a Prime membership continues to grow with this offer. This is the critical statement. Now, it's of course a very obvious statement, but my comment here is how this boosts Amazon Prime, how this sort of offering continues to add to the value of Amazon Prime. The way it does, the way it adds value is it adds more instant access. If you think of what Amazon is doing, they are basically trying to create this company that can deliver you a product instantly. That's really what the Amazon Prime subscription, I should say, is. Obviously, they have Amazon Web Services and a couple of other products, right? Amazon Alexa. They're, they're doing a lot. But the main thing they're doing with Amazon Prime is giving you fast and easy and instant, in most cases, access to the things that you want instant access to. Music, movies, items that you can order to your doorstep in sometimes hours, and now food. You can now subscribe to Amazon Prime and get instant access to food delivered right to your front door. That's the value of Prime. Now, this is like a literal fixed cost for most families. It is factored in to the sum of things for most families. They just assume, okay, let's subscribe to Amazon Prime. We're going to renew this every year. We don't care what the price is. It adds too much value for so many families around the country. And that's why I like this move because it continues to add value, instant value, mind you. Um, the Grubhub Plus subscription, I think is a $9.99 subscription that you would have to pay for monthly. So let's do the quick math here. I'm not sure if tax is included in that or not, but we'll take $9.99. We'll multiply it by 12. Um, that's $119.88. The price of the Prime subscription, don't quote me because I'm not sure, but I think it's somewhere in the 140s. So if you were going to subscribe to Grubhub Plus anyways, that's value and a lot of value, mind you. So moving forward um, off of the Amazon topic, we do have Minions, The Rise of Gru, destroying box office records, pardon me, destroying the success of, of course, what I hoped would do good because I do own stock in Disney, um, Lightyear. It absolutely blew things out of the water. I just went and saw it at a drive-in with my girlfriend. It was a pretty funny movie. Obviously, you don't get quite the experience of a normal movie theater when you're at a drive-in. It's a little more um, gimmicky, if you will, but we watched the movie nonetheless. It was a pretty funny movie. They went with, and I think this was talked about here, a lot of that kind of fast, just like giggly moments. It wasn't so much of um, a story as it was like, hey, here's this really silly, funny movie about the rise of Gru. I love the movie. It was great. It made an estimated $125 million over that four-day weekend, absolutely smashing box office records, and was the best 4th of July holiday weekend movie over Transformers, which did $115 million back in 2011, wasn't even able to be touched in, what is this, 11 more years, um, and now being destroyed by Minions Rise of Gru. So this is obviously fantastic for 
um, Universal, which is owned by NBC, which is uh, CNBC, which I'm always on, which is Comcast, whatever, whatever. So obviously a, a really, really good move here um, with this movie and with everyone involved in this movie, probably making a ton of money, as well as rejuvenating movie theaters, which just like cruise lines were a massive industry that was destroyed by the pandemic now being revitalized by a ton of these movies and the absolute crazy trend of walking into a movie theater with like a hundred of your friends in full-blown suits. Really funny. Basically, movie theaters had to ban people wearing suits into their movies because of everything that was going on. So... That is everything that has went on this week in finance. If you enjoyed, if you learned something new, if you like my commentary or want to comment on my ideas, go ahead and comment something down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video, I guess. Leave a dislike if you didn't like it. But you know what? If you're thinking of leaving a dislike right now, do me a salad. Put some good karma into the world, into the atmosphere, and just leave a like. And then go ahead, hit subscribe as well. Hit the bell so you're notified every time a new video comes out. And with that being said, I hope you all have a great day. Take care.